theyeshiva.net. What, what do you yeah. do with the kids? Yes. With, with Elio and Ovi. You spoke about it by this man, don't you? That you shouldn't, you shouldn't tell the kids lies and stuff. But when I was raised, they said, okay, you have to tell the kids they don't have a drink from the cuffs. And if, what you do is you turn them around, you shake the table. But it's not honesty. What do you tell the kids? I'm asking. You don't shake the table. I'm asking, what do you tell them? The kids come home from school, they say, teacher said, I don't know comes at night and drinks the cuffs. What do you answer? I know my daughter's going to ask me to. She'd ask me. I survived. <laughs> Thank you. Don't I ask a question. Why because I told you to check the tape. But Mahis the Shavak, no, it's a real question. Did you sleep? Cut from the little little bikinis later. So one year he decided to hide. Yeah. Watch it. So the father puts it back in the bottle. Left all of it. Yeah, there are always there. That's why I'm asking. But what do you tell your daughter? Or you I know the mice first hand. It's not, I don't know it tenth hand. Oh, it's a real story. <laughs> Yeah. Rabbi, so what's the right answer to my daughter or my son when they asked me? Somebody sent it out, uh, the story, so I wanted to know if it's true. So I, I did some. Uh... What happened was there was a fellow, and he said, he said this recently, I think he said it last year. He lives in a very beautiful uh, religious community not far from here. And he said that when he was, uh, when he was a kid, his father would always say, that Elio Anovi comes in the middle of the night after everybody goes to sleep, drinks up the whole cup, and cleans it out also, and puts it back in the cabinet, and but everybody is asleep. And this was like an amazing thing. So one night, one year he decided, I think he was six years old or seven, very little kid, he's going to stay up a whole night to watch it. Imagine the schus to see Elio Anovi. And he stayed up, he stayed up. And what does he see? He saw his father after everybody went to sleep. His father went and took it and poured it back into the bottle and washed it off and put it actually in the china closet, which was in his bedroom where he slept. It was a closet. That's where he kept it. And he saw it all. And he said, and at that moment... <laughs> that's what his father meant, huh? He said, and at that moment, it shattered his whole, uh, his whole amuna. So that means Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is also his father invented, Kriyas Yamsev his father invented, Matan his father invented. So what do we do with this? Father? And he said, and his father meant, he said he knows that his father probably meant well. His father was trying to inspire the child, the child with miracles. But the, the father was making a very big mistake. It's a mistake that some people make. It's a similar thing I told you about the moon once, you remember? There was a Yid, he was nine years old, he was in a classroom in a particular community, also very prominent Jewish community, very religious. And they went on the moon, this is 50 years ago, Mamish 50 years ago, August 1969. Uh, Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz uh, Aldrin, they went on the moon, and they landed on the moon. And he asked his teacher in class, he was nine, that we say in the brach of Kiddush Lavana, Keshem shani reikit kenegdech veini yachil in goyabach. I can't touch you. And here, not only did they touch the moon, they stood on the moon, they planted an American flag on the moon, they brought back, uh, they brought back uh, souvenirs, earth from the moon, they took a picture on the moon, that's more than touching, they spent time on the moon, they landed on the moon. <laughs> the Israelis were listening to the Nusach of Kiddush Lovana, so Eni Yochel and Goyabach, the spacecraft said, I can't touch. That's the Israelis, but the Americans landed on the moon. So what did his teachers say? His teacher said that it never happened. This was a conspiracy. And the teacher identified two groups who were part of the conspiracy. One was Goyim and there was another group also. And they, with Hollywood, they went to Hollywood and they produced a film, all fiction, of landing on the moon, simply to deceive people. Now, he was nine years old. He said, I knew at that moment that the teacher is lying from his teeth. He doesn't believe it. He's just saying it to be able to answer this great question. At that moment, he says, everything I learned till that point was just deleted from my brain. I said, I said to myself, he said, I cannot trust a thing that comes out of their mouth. Now, this teacher doesn't even, wouldn't even be aware of what he did. He thought he was protecting the Messiah. That's what he was trying to do. I'm sure he meant well. I'm not judging him. 
In his mind, this is how you protect tradition. You protect it from all questions and problems and leaks. You don't let anybody see the ugly problems. But what that means is that deep down, you don't believe Yiddishkeit is emes. And because you don't really believe it's emes, so therefore you always have to fabricate and cover up and uh, always protect it. What are you protecting it from? Truth doesn't have to be protected. Falsehood has to be protected. If you have a company and the company is illegit, <laughs> you have to protect it from any other eyes to watch it, to see it. But if it's legitimate, here, look at my books. Look, you want to look further? You want to look at the fine print? Look at the fine print. You want to take a microscope? Take a microscope. If it's true, I'm not afraid. And it doesn't mean I always have every answer. The teacher could have said, yeah, let's ask somebody. It's a good question. Let me think about it. What does this come from? It comes from, it comes from a very, very deep fear or insecurity or just not thinking, really not thinking. That's why I think that in Chinuch, especially today, when kids are ahead of the game, <laughs> you're never allowed to say anything that's not true 100% even with the best intentions. This doesn't mean every child has to know everything that's going on everywhere. But to lie, never. Yeah. To lie, not. Is there a makar? Is there a makar for what? With the kashar or to tell the kids that? <laughs> Why is it called what kashar or What do you understand? What do you see? Do you what does it have to do? I don't Is Hashem by the Seder? Yes. Hashem is by the Seder. Does Hashem drink from the cup? No. I drink from the cup for Hashem. So, so what's in of kashar or Maybe that's what we didn't learn. That's what's missing. Okay, so that we so we, we need a shear for kashal aliyo, but I don't see the benefit of telling children something that's not true. I don't see so the I benefit. Many years about it. So this year, I mean, I was a kid. They always shook the table, but we all know no, it was like part of the you know it was a part of the. You know why it's called kashal aliyo? So the Vilna Gaon says, because there's a machlaikus in Gemara, Reb Tarifin says you have to have a fifth cup. Yeah. So between the two opinions, we do a fifth cup and we don't drink it. So the Vilna Gaon says, and all, since all the questions that are not resolved, Eliyahu Anavi is going to answer. So that's why it's called Kaisal Eliyahu. The cup that Eliyahu Anavi will answer. I'm saying that's just one explanation why it's called Kaisal Eliyahu. That's what the Vilna Gaon writes. So why do you open the door? Okay, then there's something else. That's one Nikud. Another Nikud is another explanation. This is Pasha Talpi, very Pshat. Yeah. Alit Vishib Pshat, Vilnagan's Pshat. It's a good Pshat. And then there's the concept of, um, of um, I'll tell you how he puts it in Shulchan Aruch. Give me a Shulchan Aruch there. Yeah, the Chachamim. Yeah, about a fifth cup. Do we have a fifth cup or not? So the Vilna Gaon says, because it wasn't resolved, so we just put the cup. We don't drink it, we put it. So he says, since Eliyo Anovi is going to resolve all the questions, teku, tish be a so therefore it's called question shal Eliyo. The cup that Eliyo Anovi is going to resolve. Shulchan I have one answer. In Psachim, in Arvi Psachim, I could show you. Huh? That's what he says. The Vilna Gaon says this. I saw it by him. Dissolves it, huh? Dissolves it. In Shulchan Aruch Harav, the Balatanya, Hilchas Pesach, Simon Tov Pei, he says, we open the door in order to remember that it's a Lel Shimurim, it's a night of protection, quoting the Ramah in Shulchan Aruch, Simon Tov Pei, and that we're not afraid, we're trying to transcend fear. That's a good message. And this Amun of the Jewish people who are not afraid and remember that it's a night of protection, this is part of the Amunah that will bring Mashiach. In some pe places, that, that says what the Ramah says. In some places, they have a minute not to lock the doors because it's a Lel Shemurim. And if Elio Hanavi is going to come, they say we want that the door should be open and we should be able to go out swiftly. And and we believe this. This is Sefer Hamanik and the Chak Yaakov, right? That's why the Krishna and Lel Shemurim, the night of protection. So this, the very fact that Jews believe that there's going to be redemption and that the world is going to be redeemed. If Eliyahu Anavi comes, we want the door should be unlocked, that he could come, we can come out. This Amun, he says, has a tremendous schar. This is, he's quoting Sefer Hamanik, Chak Yaakov, Magan Avram. He says, with ganavim ein lismechalanes. Places where there are ganavim, you shouldn't rely on a miracle. 
Commission is very basim and tough lamad gimel. Whenever it's shchicha hazeika, you don't rely on miracles, even if you're doing mitzvahs. Shluchi mitzvah in hazeika, we don't say if shchia hazeika if it's a if it's a common thing. The noyagin be medinas eila, we have a minig in these medinas. Limza kais echad yoisem rehamasubin to pour an extra cup that we're not going to drink. The koyin oisek kais shalalayaw anave, and it has a name, the kais of alayaw anave. First of all, it's important to understand this is a minig. The noyagin be medinas eila, right? Okay, now. So he just says it's called Kashal Aliyanavi. What's the reason for this? So this there's different interpretations, right? So I told you the interpretation of the Vilna Gaon, because it's a questionable Kais, so we call it the Kais of Aliyahu, meaning we're waiting for Aliyahu to uh, resolve it. Okay. That's number one. The Talmud of the Maharil says the reason is because if Aliyahu Anavi comes the night of Pesach, and we're hoping he's going to come, we're hoping he's going to come, and we wait for him. So we're trying to emphasize the fact that we're waiting for Eliyahu, we're waiting for Mashiach, and says, and if he comes and he reveals himself, Tzarech Gam Hulakais, he will need the cup. But you see, the tr- there's no, there's not, he doesn't see he drinks the cup. Like we said before, if Eliyahu he comes, you want the door to be open. You see, if you look for the truth, you find something. Another explanation is, another explanation is, the reason for this cup is, one second, because... When does, why does Eliyahu Anavi Bechlal, why, why, according to this, it's not even that Eliyahu Anavi comes, it's like we're anticipating his coming, we hope that he comes, it's not even that he comes, it's not what he says, it's we're anticipating his coming, we're preparing, we're hoping, we want to, we want to be ready, we want to be ready, okay. There's also another explanation, a beautiful explanation why it's called Kushal Eliyahu Anavi, and that is that, uh, uh, the, it says in Pirkei de Rebelezer, it's a very beautiful explanation, it says in Pirkei de Rebelezer, which children should know, Perik Chavtes, that Eliyahu Anavi told Hashem, Kanoi ki neisi Hashem tzvakais. I'm the only one who cares about Hashem. All the prophets, there's 400 prophets who worship Avedah Zara, Anoichi nishartil levadi, I'm the only one who remained a prophet to God because all the Jewish people abandoned your covenant. Azvu was brischa, they all destroy the covenant. They're not really connected to Judaism anymore. That's what Eliyahu Anavi tells the Jewish people. So the Medrash says, God said to Eliyahu Anavi, you say that the Jewish people abandoned my covenant? Chayech, I swear, you're going to go to every single bris and see that they maintained the covenant. So Eliyahu Anavi goes to every bris. You know why? Because he's the one who doubted it. He's the one who said the Jews are not real anymore. So God's, uh, it says in Tanakh, in Malachim, it says clearly, you, they abandoned your bris, they're not interested. So Hashem says, you go to every single bris, so you could testify the truth. Okay, in other words, that's why he's going to every bris. The halacha by carbon Pesach is, right, that v'chal are lo yoichal boy. Somebody who doesn't have a bris can't eat the carbon Pesach. So whoever is eating the carbon Pesach had a bris. Okay. The night of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, the Jews had a bris to be able to eat the carbon Pesach. So Eliyahu Anavi is there. So by every say that Eliyahu Anavi is there because of the bris. In other words, to testify, to testify who the Jewish people are. So that's another, another explanation of the connection of Eliyahu Anavi. I would just add, just to give it a little more hamtaka, that when we speak about Eliyahu Anavi, what are we talking about? We learned here about Malachim, Serafim. So he says, what's Malachim and Serafim? Yeah. Nehi, Chagas, Chabad, Shluchim, Svidis. When we speak about Malachim, we imagine Eliyahu Hanavi, some creature, like they have the song, the flying Lakshan Kugel eater, who flies through the window and uh, sips the cup and flies out. A Malach is the Pshat, a spiritual dimension that exists in the world. Malach means a Shliach. A Shliach it doesn't necessarily, you know, we, we define it always in very concrete terms. It's an energy, it's a divine energy that's in the world. That you say, a mitzvah creates a malach. What a mitzvah creates a malach? To somebody with wings that flies around my head when I do a mitzvah. A mitzvah creates a malach means everything we do creates energy. Those energies are angels. That's what an angel means. Angel doesn't mean you have, you know, white wings and red wings and blue wings. These are all me- metaphors. Ruchni is there's no wings. Yeah, we always have to, we have to uh, be sensitive to what we're talking about. When we give mishalim, mishalim are just here to help people understand the nimshal, not to bring everything down to the lowest levels. 
So you speak about Elio and Novioso, you're talking about a certain Kayach of Elikus, a certain Indian of godliness. Yeah. So the Marshal is a Maisa that uh, the Balshamtev once uh, was approached by a student of his, and he said, I would like to see Elio and Novi. There's a concept called Gili Elio. I want to see Elio and Novi. Yeah. So the Balshamtev said, What do you need it for? He said, He really wants to see. And he begged and pleaded and pleaded. And after a long time, the Balshamtev said, If you want to see Elio and Novi, so Pesach is coming. Yeah. Go to this, this house in this city. It's a very poor home, but go there with a lot of food and bring all the food for the Seder because they don't have. And be there for the first days of Pesach and you'll see Elio and Novi. So he's very excited. He gets permission from his wife. Once in a lifetime, he's actually going to see Elio and Novi, and he fills up his wagon with a lot of food and meat and chicken and fish and fruit, vegetables, all the good things, and matzah, wine, the best of the best. And he goes to this particular house before Yom Tov, and he knocks on the door, and he asks if he could stay with them. So the lady says, you could stay with us, but you don't want to stay with us because we have nothing. We're broke. We're very poor. And he sees the matzah in the house was pretty dire and desperate. Windows were broken. The ceiling was caved in. There were no beds. You know, they would sleep on straw. It was a house filled with kids without, without a piece of bread or a piece of matzah. So he said, don't worry, I have food. Tell the kids to come out and take in the food. Children never saw so much food in their life. Asimcha and shtetl. Vatehi asimcha gdoyla admai. They were so happy. They're bringing all the food into the house. And he's there for the first two nights of Pesach. And they're fine people, simple Jews, God-fearing Jews. But Elio and Avi, he didn't see <laughs> he waited and waited. He thought, "No, Shvei Chamos Chakayshel Elio, Halal Benching L'Shan Abba." There's no Elio. The first night, the second night, and he was very hurt. You know, well, Shem Tov told this to him. It was like he felt, uh, as we would say in English, duped. He really felt duped, deceived. Yeah, huh? Like Chakayshel Elio. Yeah, his mom was deceived. You know, he went with a mysterious nefesh and a sacrifice. And so after Yom Tov, he went to the Baal Shem Tov. And he came in and he said, uh, fine, fine Jews, wonderful Jews, but there was no Elio Navi there. <laughs> so the Baal Shem Tov told them, I want you to go back to the house, but this time don't go in, stay outside. Stay outside of the house. So he was very perplexed, was was yet, you know, he goes back and he's standing outside of the house and he's standing, the Baal Shem Tov said, so he does what his achos, does what his Rebbe says, so he's, especially the Baal Shem Tov, so he's standing outside. So the windows were broken, pretty broken. So you can hear the conversations. At some point, a state, a state, he's standing and he hears the husband speak to his wife. And he tells his wife, ah, this is called mazel. What were the chances that a wealthy, wealthy man with a wagon filled with food to the top should get stuck <laughs> by our house just before Yom Tov and decide to come spend Yom Tif with us and give our children an unbelievable Pesach. What are the chances? This is what's called mazel. So his wife says, first day stock up. What are you hacking at Shainik? What mazel? It was Elio Anavi. <laughs> Elio Anavi came. Hashem sent Elio Anavi to give our kids a Yom Tif. That's who it was. And then he understood what the Baal Shem Tov meant. He wanted to say Elio Anavi. So the Baal Shem Tov said, if you want to say Elio Anavi, I'll tell you how to see. I'll tell you how to see Elio Anavi. Take a wagon, fill it up with food, feed nine hungry children, then go look at the mirror, and you'll see Elio Anavi. And this is very important, because when we speak about seeing Elio Anavi, the first and foremost Elio Anavi you have to meet is the Elio Anavi inside yourself. And that's the truth. It's not... Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not Stam. I don't, I don't mean to take... Of course there's Elio Anavi. When you speak about Ruchnias, Ruchnias is not wings that fly through windows. You understand? Ruchnias is, is, is here and now. It's the Pnimius of the world. A lakus godliness is not some force in heaven. It's the pnimius of a person. Gilei Yahu means his galos of a certain inyan in your own neshama. There's the p'chin of Eliyahu in your own neshama. 
That's what a malach is. That's what godliness means. That's what he's saying. Melech, malche, amlochem, malach, shliach, sort of. That's what we learned today. What does it mean practically malach? Yeah, he says malach is nehi and sort of is chagas and, 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 and shliach is chabad. Ani is chachma. <laughs> what was, what's chabad? Chabad, chagas, and is a parts of you, parts of me. And also beyond us, of course. I don't mean Elio Anovi is only inside of me, but I'm saying that's the, that's the essence of Elio Anovi. Gili Elio means a certain gili of, 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 of yourself. So you say Elio Anovi comes to the Seder, you say, you want to see Elio Anovi by the Seder, you be Elio Anovi. You're empowered to find Elio in you. That's Gili Elio. So I could look in the mirror and see the devil. I could look in the mirror and see Elio Anavi. Which one is true? The answer is they're both true. If I take a wagon, I fill it up with food and I feed nine children, I'll look in the mirror, I'll see Elio Anavi. If I do something else, I'll look in the mirror and I'll see the Malach Amavis. Both true. <laughs> it's both true. That's Gili Elio. Huh? If you do both, yeah, if you do both, it's because a person is a confused soul and they don't know who they are and they don't trust in their Elio Anavi. They don't trust the stock. So they have to invest in other stocks too. So they can get. Huh? Yeah. The minute they will believe that they Elio Anavi, they will see nothing. They won't have to. In other words, why do we invest money in different stocks? In case this one goes down, this one will go up. In Ruchnius, a lot of us do the same thing. We invest in a lot of stocks because we don't trust any of them. In other words, we're not investing in godliness. We're investing in stocks. When a person is investing in something true, they don't have to invest in a lot of places. You know what I mean? When a person is really married, they don't have to be married to many people. If a person is not really married, you know, there's this one, there's that one, there's that one. When you're married, you're not married to one person. When you're not married, then you I can't commit to you because there's no trust. So therefore, I'm here, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. Sometimes I'm not committed to anybody because I don't trust. Yeah, that's the opposite. Sometimes I'm committed to every... Being committed to everybody and being committed to nobody is more or less the same thing. So when we don't trust, we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust our ability to see truth. We have to invest in a lot of different places because maybe this, maybe that, maybe that. You know, they say the story about an old Jew who was dying, so he called the priest. And he said before he dies, he wants him to baptize him. So his son looks and says, Tata He says, listen, you never know, you know, before I die, you never know. <laughs> He says, if it's Emma's, fine, I'll die, I'll go to paradise. And if not, yeah, he says, Nacha Christ gepeget. Monofshech, right? No. And we understand what I'm saying. But the union of telling children something that's untrue in Yiddishkeit, I think is an educational mistake. And not only a mistake, I think it's a wrong thing. I don't see why people have to do it. Was felt ois is not enough to say that's true. Like, what do you have? Okay, so that's the question. What emuna is? <laughs> What's emuna? The problem is that so many people think emuna is not truth. Emuna means things we believe in. Flying luxury kugel leaders. Things we believe. You have to hack it out to your kids. Emuna doesn't mean falsehood. Emuna means truth. The word amun, you know what the word amuna means? Imun means trust, confidence. Amen, what does amen mean? You know what amen you want to, huh? Amen means it's true. The definition, amuna means to believe something that's true. <laughs> if you believe in something that's not true, it's stupid. It's not amuna, it's foolish. That's, it's a cult. Huh? So how you process it is, is a discussion. You can listen to my basics of emuna, but emuna means adain legin emin in the kinder. What's tough in adain legin in the kinder? Emes nishkin sheker. So if people define emuna as falsehood, then yeah, you just brainwash your kids with with falsehood, and 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 they'll stay in the tradition. 
Why, why would you want to teach your children something that's not true? Why would a father want to do that to a child? Basically, it's the worst thing against them. It's, it's, it's the opposite of emunah. The whole idea of emunah is the exact opposite. The, idea, the word emunah means truth. Imun. Imun, even in Hebrew, means confidence. So you have confidence in it. What happens if they don't know the answer? So if somebody really doesn't know an answer, they could say it's a very good question. Let's go ask somebody. We could speak to somebody, we could call somebody, we could meet somebody. And you could call somebody you respect and have a, ask a question. Look, why does a person always have to feel the need to have all the answers? And if they don't, they have to make up an answer that's not true. Like Kiddush Levana, it's a good question. The boy, if, if a nine-year-old boy would ask me that question, come over to me, I would actually stop and say, you know what, this kid is going to go places. Uh, he may end up in the moon, on the moon. Instead... Why would you say that Hollywood did this? You know you're lying. Why? In other words, you don't believe. In other words, you also think. It's even worse because this teacher also believes that the Chazal made a mistake. Because he knows that they went onto the moon. He's just lying to himself. And he's selling a Yiddish guy that he doesn't believe in. So basically, he's selling to his children a dream that he doesn't really believe in because he just wants to, you know, the company has to continue. The Ponzi scheme of Bernie Madoff got to go to the next generation. Why are you doing that? Because you yourself don't really believe it. You just feel it's all, you were sold a boat, now it's your time to sell the boat to the next generation. That's what it is. But whenever you, whenever, when, it, when, when it's, when the Titanic is going to hit the iceberg, it's going to sink. It's going to sink. Because there's, there's nothing to the boat. It's a beautiful boat. The moment it hits an iceberg, so to speak, metaphorically, there's no boat anymore. It goes underwater. Because the whole basis was just shkarim. Now, I'm not even judging this person. He probably wasn't thinking much. He was just programmed, you know? He was programmed. What's wrong with saying it's a good question? Let me think about it. The same time, the same time, the same time, in a neighborhood, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes away, yeah? Is given ayid, yeah? And he spoke about it, and he asked this question. He asked the question. He didn't wait for a kid to ask the question. He asked it publicly, Shabbos at a Fabrengen. How do we say Kiddush Levana Eini Yachel in Goyabach? Yeah. And he said, he said, the answer is not a complicated answer. The answer is, read the words before. Keshem shani reiket kenegdech ve'eini Yachel in Goyabach. I'm here on the ground, jumping, and I can't touch you. <laughs> That's what he's saying. When you're on the ground making Kiddush Levana outside of Shul, you cannot touch the moon. Where does it say in the Nusach Kiddush Levana that man cannot invent a spacecraft to reach the moon? Where does that say? There's a, ah, such a pasuk, a gemara. You're saying, Kishem Shani could connect it right now. It's not a complicated answer. So the teacher didn't figure that out. Fine. So say, What's wrong with I don't know? Let's find out. Let's, let's, let's research it. So that's why, you know, people become very, very cynical. They grow up, they become very, very cynical. Kids also know right away when it's true or not true. You know that, right? There's not a single child in the world that you could lie to for a long time. They feel, they feel, they know. Even if they won't say it, they won't tell they it to you. They know that they know. That, so. But they still know, they know. Even if a child thinks, they don't, children don't want to believe that their parents are lying. So they will tell themselves that it's true, but they know that it's not true. I don't know any kid that you could lie to. Maybe a three-year-old. Once they get a little older, they know, they right away feel. Even three-year-olds feel. But it's very painful for a child to believe that his children are lying. So children, his parents, so his ch the child will repress what he knows is a lie. So the lie detectors yeah, they, they lie. I mean, we, we know even we as adults, we feel sometimes, right, when something is, is, is untrue. We just feel it. It's just it's your father and mother, and, and you trust them for everything. So it's, you don't want to say that they're lying. So therefore, you tell yourself they're not lying, which is basically you're also causing psychological damage to the child because you're creating inner conflict in him. He has to choose between what he knows is true and, and what he wants to be true because who wants to know that their father is saying not true? So besides religious damage, you're also creating psychological damage, I believe. And that's just my opinion. But I think it's very sound. 
Where it says that Gavra Rabba, yeah. many times, Gavra Yeah, yeah. So Shom says, Man Gavra Rabba. Why is he called Gavra Rabba? Because if he, somebody asks him a question he doesn't know, he says he doesn't know. Yeah. So I know him. Yeah. There's a story in Gemara, one of the Amirayim, I think it was Rabba Rabashi, came to the Beshmaj and he said, Dvarim Shamati Lefnechem Tau Sein Biyadi. I said to you something and it was a mistake. Dvarim Shamati Lefnechem Tau Sein Biyadi. How how do how do I do those mistakes? Because I'm personally guilty of, for example, telling kids a lot of stories, Sid Shemaisis, that they tell me later, 20 years later, that they don't believe in it. So, and, uh, don't do it, it's very hard. Well, if I told my child something that's not true, I can apologize and say I thought so or I made a mistake or whatever it is, and I can apologize. I don't even know if it's true. He said something like the convention, and then later he came and said I made a mistake. I don't remember exactly what it was. Do you I mean, I used to read. I used to read the stories. Even I have. I have. I've heard this. There's a lot of stories. right. So you hear you. We read Shulchan Aruch Harav. You can read the Rishonim, the Chreinim, all the Chabakoshel Eliyahu. Nobody ever says something untrue that he drinks from the cup. They'll never speak like this. You'll never f- catch. You'll never catch these types of people. And even a guzma, what they say is tachlus amas. The thing just to make uh, make everybody feel good and make action and this. There's enough action. There's there's, ac- there's real action. You don't have to make new action. <laughs> no, in, in the Shulchan Aruch itself, the the the, the, the Batan doesn't give reasons. I was just saying from the foot. Does the Alpha say anything about the post itself that you shouldn't throw it out, that you could preserve it and it has value? No, no, it doesn't. Shake Batan? He was just brings out. So I brought from the students of the Maharal that it's because of a Muna that we hope Leo and Novi come. So we want to show anticipation, right? And uh, and the second reason is from Reb Moshe Chagiz. Reb Moshe Chagiz was one of the big Achirayim. He says the reason about the bris that the whole reason Eliyahu and Avi comes to every bris is because he said that Jews abandoned the bris. So that's a beautiful idea to speak about that because Eliyahu and Avi spoke against the Jews, so therefore for thousands of years he shows up at every bris. <laughs> when a person gets up at a drasha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When a person gets up in a drush and says the Jewish people are filthy and dirty and, and they're, they're, they're goyim and they're not real. So when Elio Anovi did that for thousands of years, the poor man no, has to go to every thousand, single bris. Once he's had a thousand years and one second the same thing. <laughs> No, but it's a beautiful idea about how to speak about Jews. It's a tremendous idea. And that's why he comes to the Seder because this is the time when they ate the carbon base and everybody had to have a bris. And the night of Yitzhi Masan, it's a beautiful idea of Moshe Chagiz. Very, very nice. The Lubavitcher Rebbe asks in his Haggadah that according to this idea, there is a question because then you should have poured the cup in the beginning of the Seder, at least before the Afikaiman, which is a Zeichel of Pesach. This is the Rebbe Shaila. It's a good Shaila. <laughs> the light of Moshe Chagiz, you should have poured it before the Afikaiman because it's Zeichel of Pesach. That's when you should. Well, we don't do it. We pour it after. That's an interesting idea. Where I grew up, we put it in the beginning. The beginning of the Seder? By the second. Really? Ah, interesting. Rabbi Moshe Chagiz in the Sefer Birchus Eliyahu. It's interesting ideas, beautiful stuff. So if it's an energy created by a mitzvah, and you can we're not flying Google here. When, 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 you, when there's a Sefer that is written by Eliyahu, when you learn with people, how do, how do you explain No, of course. How do you explain that he, yeah. he didn't no, no, Elio was a person. I didn't. And then he went up, he went up, it says, with his body. So there were times that Elio and Novi came manifested in a body, in a goof, that you could see him. But we all know that by our Seder, that doesn't happen. <laughs> At least not for our eyes. You know, I don't know quantum mechanics. <laughs> well, the Pusik says that he didn't, that the Pusik says that he went up, he went up with his goof. So there was a different type of death, so, sort of say, parts so to speak, yeah. So there's a concept of Gilio Leoanovi in the Guf. There's a concept of Gilio Leoanovi in the Shama, just like an, a, 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 a certain energy, a Ruach HaKodesh, Nevua, a certain awareness. That's not what was Shema in death. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the expert on Gilio Leo. I never had Gilio Leo. I don't know what it is. Huh? It says Pinchas yeah. 
But I know I could fill up a wagon with food and feed children. That I could do. And sometimes that's the deepest Elio. You know, you have to know, you have to know your Elio Anovi. You can't get somebody else's Elio Anovi. It seems, seems to be what he asked earlier was, is that there's different roles for him. And yeah, right. Down here learning with someone, he could drink a cup. Yeah. If he's here spiritually, he's yeah. not going to yeah. drink it. Right. Depends on how you find the vision. Yeah, but yeah. I've always wondered about this process where um, he seems to be uh, here, and then he goes there, and where does he leave his, how did, he's got a booth, he's got a part-time booth, or something. I'm not making a joke. I'm asking that people that appear. Yeah, I'm saying, according to many of the sources here, it's not even that Elio Anovi comes. It's that we're waiting, we're anticipating, we're opening the door for him. Let's talk. Let's, about, about the let's bris, that it's a bris that yeah, no, the bris means he does come spiritually, yeah. So that's another interpretation. But I'm saying the other interpretations is that it's basically part of our emuna. And let's speak about it in healing. In healing, healing doesn't come right away, but you have to open yourself up for it. You open yourself up for it, things happen. So we open the door, Felio. It's also a very beautiful idea. You open the doors, you open, you remove the barriers and the blockages. These are powerful ideas. We don't need to substitute these ideas with... Uh, also, it's, it builds my sensitivity. Papa Mises. It's about sensitivity. He stumped because of us, because he told us that we don't have, uh, we don't keep the bris. So we actually help him to, in a way, to... Yeah, come inside, look what's going on over here. Yeah, I'll show you the source. You wanted the source for the idea of the Vilna Gaon. I'll show you, okay? So if you're not put up a Psachim, Tav Kuf Yud Ches, right, we have the Braise, Tav Kuf Yud Ches, you see, Tonu Rabbanon, the rabbis taught, Kais Revi Oymir Alav Halal Hagadol. Divri Reb Tarifin. Reb Tarifin says that on the fourth cup, we say Halal Hagadol, which are basically the Haidus, Haidu Lashem Kitav Kilay Lam Chazdai, all the all the haidus till the end. All the way till the end. However, there is a different girsi in the Gemara, a different version in the text of the Gemara that's brought by many many ga'inim and many many rishayim, like. Uh, you have the Balalach is those Rabbi Saadi Gon, Rabbi Amram Gon, a bunch of Goyenim, and also Rabbi Nachanan, Rishonim, Rabbi Nachanan, the Rif, the Rambam, and many. And according to their version in the Gemara, the Gemara says Kais Chamishi Oimir Alav Halala God Al Divir Reptarfin, not Kais Revi, but Kais Chamishi. In other words, Reptarfin says that you have to have a fifth cup on which you say Halala God. That means there's not four cups by the Seder, but five cups of the Seder. And some of the Rishonim explain, the Raivid and others explain, that the reason for the four cups is, one of the reasons is, the Yerushalmi tells us, because the Torah uses four languages when it comes to the redemption from Egypt. In the beginning of Parshas of Eire, right? V'hitzesi, v'hitzalti, v'ga'alti, v'lakachti. I will take you out, I will rescue you, I will redeem you, and I will retrieve you, I will take you. Reb Tarfin, the Raivid says, he says a fifth cup, because it also says v'hei I'm going to bring you. I'm going to take you out. But then, yes, I'm going to bring you to the promised land, to Eretz Yisrael. So that's one opinion of why the Ptarifin believes in the fifth cup. So now, so this is where the Vilna Gaon comes. The Vilna Gaon says, his, his view is brought by Sodan Tami Amen Hagim. He says as follows. Since Reb Tarifin holds, according to so many Goinim and Rishonim, that you need a fifth cup, the Chachamim don't say you need a fifth cup. They say you need four cups. And since there was no clear halacha, just like we learned with Hillel, right? There was no clear halacha this way or that way. So the Vilna Gaon says, therefore, we pour the fifth cup, we fill up the fifth cup, but we don't drink it. <laughs> you pour it and you don't drink it. And that's why he says it's called Kaisish al Because since Teku, since al was going to resolve all the questions, Tishbi Yitaritz Koshiz Vabayis, right? So therefore, this is, so to speak, the cup that al Hanavi has to resolve. What's the right thing to do? Should we not pour it? Should we pour it and drink it? So we do like, we're in the middle, like we're in limbo. We pour it, but we don't drink it. That's what the Vilna Gaon explains why it's called Kaisi Shalal Yeah, it's interesting. The Rambam, if you look in the Rambam, right, Hilchis Chametz Matzah, the last chapter, Perik Ches, I think. The Rambam and his Halachis of Chametz Matzah, the Rambam also brings this. The Rambam tells us in Hilchis Chametz Matzah, he says that, Yeshloi Limza Kais Chamishi. The Rambam says you should pour a fifth cup and say on it the halal of Haidul Hashem Kitaiv. 
And then the Rambam says that Kaiza ain't no chayve k'mayar b'kaisus. That it's not an. Ob- the Rambam says that this cup is not an obligation like other four cups. The Rambam doesn't talk about drinking. He just says to to pour to pour the fifth cup. There's a lo- huge discussion about this. A huge discussion about this. Uh, the famous chiddush uh, is a famous uh, discussion of the briskerov about how to understand this Rambam. But the point is that we see here that there was a fifth cup already introduced in the times of in. By the Tanayim and Abtarif, and at least according, according to many, many texts. So the Vilna Gaon says that's why it's called Kaiser Shalalayo. But then we have the other interpretation, right, based on the Achrainim, uh, the Chak Yaakov and the Shulchan Aruch Harav and the other Svarim, that basically Kaiser Shalalayo is part of our Emunah in Biyasa Mashiach. It's called Kaiser Shalalayo because this cup is a fifth cup of wine, which represents the fact that we thank Hashem for the first Geula, and we anticipate and we hope every moment for the next Geula. Like the Ramah says, why we open the doors. Now it's interesting that the Kaisal Eliyahu is not discussed in Shulchan Aruch. Right? If you look in Shulchan Aruch, in uh, Simon Tuf Pei, that's the, that's the you know, final, the, where the final, the, the end of the Seder is discussed. The Shulchan Aruch, the, the, the classic Shulchan Aruch, doesn't bring anything more than four cups. In other words, you 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 have the four cups of wine, and that's it. You don't you, we don't we don't have in Shulchan Aruch. You know, he says you have the you, you don't you you don't ha- you don't have. I'll look it up here. Simon Tuf Pei. The Shulchan Aruch speaks about the end of the Seder, but he does not mention he does not mention the Kaisel Aliyo, and the Ramah also doesn't. The Ramah speaks about saying Shvai Chamascha and opening the door to remember that it's a night of, of protection, Lel Shemurim, and the Ramah says in the schus of this Amuna, Mashiach is going to come, but they both don't mention the Kaisel Aliyo. Of course, the Mishnah Brura on the Shulchan Aruch does. The Mishnah Brura mentions it, and like from the Shulchan Aruch Harav, he says that in our countries, it's, the, it's almost verbatim from Shulchan Aruch Harav, in our countries... I think it's verbatim. We pour one extra cup, and we call it Kaisalaliyo Anavi. And the point is, as the Mishnah Brewer brings from the Acherayim, it basically intimates that we believe we have a Muna that just like the Rebbein Shalom liberated us from Egypt, he's going to liberate us again, and he's going to send Aliyo Anavi to give us the great news that Mashiach is about to come, and that's what this cup represents. As and as some Acherayim put it, like Aliyo Anavi might show up, and we got to give him a cup of wine. And this also fits very well with how the Ravid explains the view of Reb Tarifin, that it's Vehevesi. Vehevesi is the fifth, the fifth word that represents coming to Eretz Yisrael, not just leaving Mitzrayim, but coming to Ula, which also includes, of course, the ultimate arrival in Eretz Yisrael with Mashiach, Tzitkenu, when all the Jews will be brought back to Eretz Yisrael. So the fifth cup is connected with the Geula, that we open the doors for, we wait for it, we anticipate it. And it's not just opening the doors physically, it's opening the doors spiritually, it's opening your heart, it's, you know, pischuli shari tzedek, right? It's opening your heart, it's opening your soul, it's opening your amuna, it's opening your, opening yourself up from, from a gullus mentality, from a gullus, you know, from being stuck in our own confinements and our own shackles. And as I said before, to be able to reveal the Geula consciousness in yourself and the Elio Hanavi within yourself. That's how it begins. The Moirei Naim writes that in every Jew there's a spark of Mashiach. Every Jew there's a spark of Elio Hanavi. And uh, we each try to open the doors to that state of consciousness, to that type of, of godliness, to that type of Kedusha, to that type of love. And uh, we hope that, uh, we hope and we pray and that Mashiach comes. So that's why this cup, according to many, is called the cup of Elio Anavi. It's the cup that represents our our emunah in the Gula, our anticipation for the Gula, our tefillah for the Gula, our faith in the Gula, which has sustained the Jewish people for not hundreds of years, but thousands of years. So there's no need to manipulate this. It's, 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 it's so beautiful. A nation that lives with faith and a nation that lives with the past and with the present and with the future. <laughs> This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.